friends, how are you? It's Thursday morning. My name is Ali from Vintage Page Designs and I am so glad that you are here. If you're joining me live, thank you very much. Hi Marlene, hi Joanne, hi Candice. If you're new here, welcome. If you are returning, welcome back. Um, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so that you know when we have a new video playing. So um, it's near the holidays and I wanted to round out the year by ask, um, answering some of your burning questions. So I had um, sent out a newsletter asking for your questions and we got a lot of questions. So um, a few of you I have emailed directly because they were very specific and you needed links. Um, but um, for the others, I have a whole bunch of questions to answer today. Um, if you sent them in after yesterday evening, I'm afraid um, we probably won't get to them today because um, there were a lot. So I'm going to dive straight in. The questions sort of go from business questions, um, tools and supplies, and then different techniques. So we're going to kind of go through them in order. Um, let's get started. If you um, are here live and have a question, can you hold on to the end? And hopefully I'll be able to take some more questions at the end. All right, let's see. The very first question was from Marguerite Kay. And she said, what made you want to do bookbinding when you started? So I'm going to tell you my answer to that question. Um, I'd love to know in the comments, um, your answer to that question, what got you started into bookbinding? Um, for me, I mean, it's a long story, but I grew up loving paper and books. Um, and that in itself, and journaling, that was in itself was a lifelong passion. Um, when my daughter was um, a toddler, I started making mini books for her with photographs in of our family, just as a way for her to connect with her family who were far away. And then I just fell in love with the process of creating artwork that was um, interactive and kind of intimate rather than something that you put on a wall. So, um, and I then I fell down that rabbit hole of bookmaking, um, making blank books, making books with content. Um, there's just something very inviting, uh, particularly about a book that's small. Um, just there's something very inviting and tactile and cozy about holding a book and interacting with a book. Um, so that's kind of how I got started by making little mini scrapbooks. And then it just went from there. So that was back in 2000, probably 2001 is when I first started. And um, I haven't stopped and I don't see me stopping anytime soon. So great question, Marguerite. Um, I'm curious. I can't see um, anyone in the chat yet telling me how they started making books. So I'm curious, how did you start making books? What inspired you? Why did you keep making them? Um, and talking of which, a great question from Barb Shea was, what are your top three or four bits of advice or mottos? I don't know any mottos for people making handmade books. Um, my advice is to um, learn the basics. Like the basics aren't always sexy or interesting, like folding and getting cut straight and angles square, but really practicing the basics is what's gonna um, help you get better at making books. Um, I think another piece of advice would be stick to simple structures, particularly at the beginning. Um, I know we all wanna do fancy secret Belgian bindings and Coptic stitch and hardcover, hardcover leather books, but that's, you know, that, they're kind of tricky and you need some skills. So stick with basic structures and really hone your basic skills. For me, even the basic structures now are some of my favorite. And then my other piece of advice would be just um, be kind to yourself and give yourself some grace. If you were here last week, I was making these little uh, matchbooks and I got the measurements all wrong. It's okay, I'm still here next week. The world didn't end, we all make mistakes. So just try and be kind to yourself and um, don't compare yourself to others. Like this is a bookmaking thing and a life thing. So that might be my motto. Just don't compare your, what, what do they, what's the expression? Don't compare your outs, your insides to other people's outsides, something like that. Just try not to look at what other people are doing. It's nice to be inspired on Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest, but stick in your own lane if you can and try not to compare yourself. That would be my advice, Barb. Um, another question, I know we're going fast, but there are a lot of questions today, so 
I gotta, I gotta skip through it. Um, Jacqueline had uh, a question about, um, she's interested in being a, doing YouTube videos. Uh, what kind of camera do you use? And then do I edit my videos? Um, so great questions, Jacqueline. Um, I do two types of videos. I do ones where I pre-record the video. Um, and for that, I use this camera right here. It's a Canon, it's a small mirrorless camera. It's a Canon um, Mark 50, it's a Canon, what was it? Oh, what do you call it? It's a Canon, fifth, oh, here we go. It's a Canon M50 Mark II, it has it right on here. So it's a little mirrorless camera, it's lightweight and I put it on a tripod and then I turn it upside down so it goes top down on my table. So a Canon M50, um, lots of folks use their phone for doing videos as well. Um, I just, because we have the book club membership, I like to do a higher quality. Um, so I do use this and in the past I use my DSLR camera to do top down videos. And then um, I also do live videos. And for live videos on YouTube, which is like now, I'm using my um, laptop camera for my face. It's not ideal, but it does the job. So I'm just using that right now. And then when I go down onto my desk, I will be using my iPhone today. Um, and then if I'm on Zoom, I find that a document camera is really helpful for going down on your desk too. So, um, and this document camera is called a Solo 8, is the brand, if anyone wants to know, a Solo 8. It's fine. It's not the best in the world, as, but it's fine. I think the um, iPhone that I have is actually better than the document camera, but it's sometimes hard to connect. I find it hard to connect my phone to Zoom. And then in terms of editing, I, um, if I'm editing, I use iMovie. Um, I know folks use apps on their phone um, with great success to edit videos. Um, and then I have someone who helps me and I, I think she uses one of the more fancy softwares like Final Cut or Premiere Pro, something like that. Um, but if I'm doing it, I'm just in iMovie because uh, it's very basic. Um, and then the other thing, if you are doing videos, I would just say get some good sound. And um, if the sound in your laptop is a bit tinny, you may want to get a microphone. So right now I have, uh, where's my microphone? I use, um, hold on. I use a little Rode wireless microphone. So if you find a sound from your laptop's not good, you might want a microphone too. So that hopefully answers that question, Jacqueline. Um, Joanna K. Oh, I spelled your name wrong, Joanna. I'm sorry, I forgot the H on it. Beg your pardon. Sorry. Um, she uh, wants to know about pricing. This is something that we get all of the time about how to price your books. So um, there are a couple of different things here. If you're pricing it for a friend, it's going to be different than if you're pricing it to go in a local um, store. So just keep that in mind. Um, but the way I figure out, um, I figure out a wholesale price first, um, which is my materials. So did I use three pieces of paper? Well, what did they cost me to get those from wherever, Dick Blick, the art supply store? Um, how much, you know, if I got a roll of thread, figure out approximately how much thread, maybe it was 25 cents. I mean, don't you know, make a career out of figuring out, you know, the exact to the micro penny. Um, but just figure in, just throw in 10 cents for glue, throw in 25 cents for the um, the thread. Um, did you buy some, a, a fat quarter to make book cloth from the fabric store? Throw that in. So make sure you get the price of all your materials. I want you to pay yourself an hourly rate. So choose an hourly rate, whatever feels good. More than minimum wage, please, would be good. Um, then figure out what your labor was. Okay, I spent two hours making it at this rate. Or if you have any overheads, I know most of you won't have overheads, but if you do have overheads, like a studio fee, um, and if you're renting somewhere or, you, you know, your studio is in a separate building and it has, I don't know, electricity or something and that's really expensive, you do want to add in overheads if you have them. Um, and then throw in a little bit of profit too. So for that book, um, throw in $5 per book profit because you, you should be getting profit. Um, 
So that would be the wholesale price. And maybe that's the price you sell it to your friend for. And I think that's perfectly fine. If you want to sell on Etsy or you, um, you could also sell at the wholesale price, but that doesn't give you a lot of wiggle room. So I would, if you were selling on Etsy, I would at least double or triple the wholesale price. And the reason I say that is what if a local store then wants to buy your book? You'll sell it to them for wholesale and they'll mark it up to retail. But if your book is already on Etsy for a low price and then a local store is selling it for much higher, there's going to be a conflict there. So um, go from wholesale to retail by either double or tripling it. Let me see if there's any questions about that. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, let me see. Oh, I'm loving seeing how everyone got started making books. Thank you. I love that. Um, another bit of advice from Barb is um, don't confuse efficiency with enjoyment. Yeah, that's why I don't sell my books because mass producing the same book sucks all the joy out of making the books. So um, that's why I teach instead of sell my books. Great advice, Barb. All right, let me go back to the next question. Um, oh, I actually, hold on, I need to pull up a file here because um, there are lots of questions about book board and I didn't get that file up for you like I promised to. So I'm going to share with you um, a document which talks about book board, um, but it's also linked below. So it's a PDF that's also linked below. Um, where is it? Here it is. Let me open that up on my computer. Here we are. Um, so where are we? Goodness, I've lost you. I have lost you. There you go. <laughs> um, book board is a big question. Um, so um, understanding book board is, I'm just reading the question here. So I forget who put this question. I think it was Sue. Um, she bought some uh, chipboard or book board on Amazon and it was 20 point and it was too thin. And then um, Pam also asked, what is the preferred weight of book board? Um, so there is no preferred weight. Um, what I would say to you, Pam, is that um, the smaller the book, the thinner the book board. The larger the book, the thicker the book board. But we don't want to have three or four different thickness of book board. First of all, it's expensive to ship and also to store. So what I do is I choose a book board that's in the middle that is around a 0.090 or a 098, and then if it's a small book, that's perfect, it's great, it's more than enough. And then if I have a very big book, I wind up doubling that. Um, my favorite source in the US for book board is Hollanders. Um, it's fairly inexpensive. They do offer shipping, free shipping over a certain amount, and it comes in um, a good size. I think it's like 13 by 19, or maybe that's not quite the right size, but it's a, a size that I can fit on my shelf. I've ordered from other places before and they're like this. And honestly, I don't have the space. Um, I also found out recently during the challenge that Dick Blick sells book board. And I think you can order it to their local store as well uh, with free shipping. Um, let me share with you, though, um, this reference, which I've linked below as a printable PDF. Um, let's see. Share screen. Here we go. Uh, here we are. Let me share this with you very quickly. Um, it is uh, the different size of book board. So you can see for the first one, 0 0.060 is 60 point. That's a thin 1 16th of an inch book board, but um, it's good for small books. And so you can see why the 20 point that our friend bought on Amazon was no good. That's almost like file folder. So you may see it when you're purchasing it online. Um, in any of these different variations, you may, if you're in Europe, you may see it as millimeter, or you may see it as points. Um, so you can see here the 0.080 is 80 point, one twelfth of a millimeter, or uh, one twelfth of an inch, or two millimeters, et cetera, down to 0 0.098. Um, so those bottom two are the ones I generally uh, stock up on um, or buy, um, and 
they're for the larger books. If I was doing a very, very large book, like say a 12 by 12 album or something, I would double up that 0 0.098 so that it was nice and solid. Um, but yes, if you would like this book board reference, please um, click on the link below and it'll just come straight up in another tab and you can print that out. All right, hopefully you could see that. Uh, so yes, I think I answered your question, Pam. Um, all right, I think I've answered that. I will get to the scoring question in a minute, Kathy. I have it on my list. That is the next question. Let me see, let me just see if there's any comments there. Yes, so Lucy says chipboard and bookboard are two different things. Yes, you really wanna be buying bookboard if you can. Um, I would avoid chipboard. If you do have to get chipboard, um, put two pieces together. The difference is that the, the fibers in bookboard are compressed um, at a lot, are a lot more compressed, like a lot more pressure is used in the machines to compress the fibers in bookboard. So it's a lot more dense and a lot stronger than chipboard. So that means it's a lot, lot less likely to warp. So give it a choice. I'd like you to buy bookboard if you can. Um, hold on, I'm gonna keep going with the questions. If you have other questions, I promise you we will get to them. I'm gonna drop down to my desk in a minute. So here's a great question from Kathy. She says, and I would like your advice on this because I'm not sure there is one way or the other which is correct. When scoring a line in preparation for folding, is the score line on the inside or the outside of the fold? Are you when you if you're doing a mountain peak, would it be on the outside or the inside? Good question. Personally, I don't think it really matters. I'm gonna drop down to my desk and um, kind of show you what Kathy means. Um, I have never seen a rule anywhere, Kathy, which uh, says that there is one way or the other, but I'll just quickly show folks what we're talking about. There we go. Okay, let me just drop over here. I've got these for a demo in a minute. So what Kathy means is, and we have a piece of paper. Oh, you're gonna see something now, which might intrigue you a little bit. Look at this. We're testing out some acrylic spaces. Look at that. I know it's hard to see in the, um, with the big light there. So what Kathy's saying is when you score a line, is it best to fold that way with the score line on the outside of the peak? Or is it best to fold the other way? And I honestly don't think it makes a ton of difference. It might make some difference if your paper was very thick. You may want the score line where it's most visible. So Sam, scoring this like this. Here's my score line. If I put the score line on the outside, oops, where did it go? Hello. If I put the score line on the outside, it looks a little bit neater than having it on the inside. But personally, I don't think that there's a right or a wrong way to do this, um, personally, Kathy. But it's a great question. And I'd be curious to know from folks who are watching if they have um, a preference, because I, I don't. Um, Debbie says, depends on the thickness of the paper. Card makers generally tell you inside, says Barbara. Inside, says folks. Okay. Um, okay, there you go. So hive mind, my friends, hive mind. Um, let's see what are the questions we had. Here's one from Suzanne about adding bookmarks. I think Suzanne is here. Um, I rarely add bookmarks, Suzanne, so that's a really good question. This is how I would do it. If other people do it differently, please let me know. So if you have a book that has a hard cover, like, well, has a hard cover or has, um, you know, a full cover with a spine like this sewn boards and you have a book block like this, I would just tuck the, um, well, before you made it, I would glue the bookmark to the spine. So before you put the cover on, I would glue that to the spine. 
like that. Um, here's, an ex here's a book block that hasn't been um, covered yet with anything. I've just purchased this book block like this. So what you would do is you would glue it right here to the spine once you've done the sewing. So you do whatever sewing you're going to do on the spine, glue on the um, bookmark, then maybe you'd put like mull over the top or fabric or Tyvek and then put your cover on. So that's what where you would do it for a cased in book. That's how you would add a bookmark. But we mostly don't make books like that around here. If you've got one um, with a decorative spine like this, I would probably go inside the book and slide it between two stitching holes. So I've got two stitching holes here. I would most likely, um, sort of somewhere in the middle, slide the ribbon around the signature and tie a knot. Let me see if that's clearer with this book here. So yeah, right here, say um, there's how many, there's five signatures here. So I take signature number three, I would slide my ribbon between the two signatures like that, tie a knot, and then that would be your bookmark. And you can add something cute on the end. Um, and then if you've got an exposed binding, like this one here, or a Coptic binding, I generally tie it around the top row of stitching. So generally, you know, your kettle stitch. Let's open up this baby. This is um, a French link stitch with soft cover. I would probably go in the middle like this, and then wrap it around the row of stitching. I mean, be careful. You don't want to damage the, the stitching. Um, but I would just tie it around there and then um, have it dangle inside the book. So good question. Alternatively, um, I know you're into origami, Suzanne. You can make those cute little bookmarks that you um, slip on the, the top corner of your book, top left or right corner of your book. So um, that's also an option as well if you don't want to use a ribbon. Great question. This is another good question from Nancy. She was asking, can you use a Japanese screw punch to make holes in your signatures? You can, um, but you wouldn't do it in a punching cradle. Um, you'll damage your cradle, you'll damage your all. So um, I wouldn't do it in a punching cradle. I would do it on a piece of board, which I do not have. Oh, well. I would do it on top of a piece of um, scrapbook board or scrap cardboard. And what I would do, let's pretend that this is your signature. I would actually mark the holes rather than um, using a template. So I would mark the holes in the center fold and then use your screw punch. Put, it, put the signature flat on the table. And oh, no, actually, sorry, that's hard for you to see, obviously you're not gonna make marks that big, but have it flat on your table and then use a Japanese screw punch to make the um, sewing holes in your signatures. Um, just make sure that you choose the right drill bit. Don't go too big. This is a millimeter, which I know is tiny. Let me take away the question so it doesn't cover up the screen. And this is tiny. Um, just be sure that the you don't use too big a drill bit. Make sure it's just enough to accommodate your thread, but don't do it in a punching cradle, do it flat on the table. Okay, let me see. Oh, you're welcome, Suzanne. More questions, more questions. Um, what's a good all for a beginner? Great question. I think you need, Judith, I think you need two. Um, oh, this one is a little bent, whoops. Um, I really like this all, honestly. It's, you can get them on Amazon, you can get them um, in craft stores. They're just a nice, thin, basic awl. They do bend sometimes, but they're still very usable. Um, honestly, this is like maybe $3 or something. Um, there's no particular brand. Um, so I would get one like this. And the reason I like it is, so if you can see, we've got a nice even shaft here for making holes. It's not too tapered. Um, I think you can get this from Colophon. This is also available from Colophon. It's slightly bigger. Do you see the, um, the point is slightly bigger or, or thicker than this thin one? So of the two, I would just pick this thinner one. 
Um, but this is also a really nice beginner one. And again, it's from Colophon Book Arts and it's maybe not even $5. I think it's $3.95. Um, so I do really like that one. And this one I would choose if you're going to be making books with like this, with decorative bindings, and you think that you're going to be using maybe watercolor paper and a four ply thread, then you may want this slightly larger all. If you're going to be doing books with more delicate holes and a thinner thread, you're going to want to go with this one right here. So it kind of depends on what paper you'll be using. If you think you'll be mostly using thinner paper, go with this thinner one. If you think you'll be working more with watercolor paper and um, mixed media paper, go with the bigger one. And then I would also suggest that you get this other awl, which is a, a big one like this, which is slightly tapered. And again, available in lots of different places. Um, this is good for making holes in um, book board. So if you make, or in uh, leather, um, it's just got a bit more weight to it. It's a bit thicker and um, try and get one with a nice big ball here so that you can hold it in the palm of your hand and it's easy to use. So um, I would get two, a thin one for your sewing holes and then a fatter one like this for your um, the holes in your cover. Okay, what is next? Questions, questions, my friend. Could, okay, two people asked this. Joanne um, Campisi asked this and Barbara about my <laughs> curve needles. Most of you know I don't like curve needles, but that's okay. Um, let's grab my curve needle. But curved needles are really, really useful. Um, so the, the reason I don't like them is just because I find them awkward to use. It's just personal preference, but they can be very handy. So this is just what a curved needle looks like. Let me show you how, how they're useful. So say I am um, doing a Coptic stitch. Let's... Um, this is an already sewn book, but let's say we're doing some kind of link stitch or Coptic stitch. And I've got a straight needle here. Now I'm going to go down a couple layers and I have to go around this stitch here. But I can't do that with a straight needle. I have to go inside, use the needle to lever open the book then I have to bring the needle and thread around that stitch right here. If you just took the challenge, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I have to open the book up and then bring the thread around to create the, um, the link or the kettle stitch, whichever it was. But if I have a curved needle, I don't need to open up my book. So let's, let's go in here. Ouch. I tend to prick myself with this. With the curved needle, I open up the signature to obviously um, create the stitch inside, but then on the spine, I can just loop it around those previous two stitches rather than levering the book open. So that's where it's really useful to have a um, curved needle. Um, it's also, if you like doing secret Belgian bindings, a curved needle is really helpful because with the secret Belgian binding, you create the cover first. So the covers in three pieces, these two, oops, can't really see, two covers, um, two big covers, and then the spine, you create that first, and then you add in the signatures afterwards. And as you get towards the end, it's quite hard to add those signatures um, without a curved needle. So there really are situations where it's useful for getting into tight spaces. An advantage of just wrapping around the spine like this rather than levering it open is it's going to make your um, tension a lot more even than if you keep opening and closing, opening and closing the book. So, but part of it's personal preference and it's just, I'm not, I always prick myself with it. So and my fingers are all awkward. So, so that is why and how you would use a curved needle. Let me know in the um, chat if you um, have a preference, if you love curved needles or not. I would love to know. Because I know some people are just completely sold and then others are like, I don't want to use a curved needle. Okay. Let's, what else? Didn't I tell you I had a lot of questions? 
Um, Marlene asks, what are the different materials you can use for book covers and is there a different process for attaching them? So um, for hard book covers, you can use a ton of different things. So this right here is a hard book cover. You can use a uh, book cloth, which, so this is fabric, which has been backed with paper. You can wrap a book in paper of some kind. Um, you could also use a uh, very thin paired leather, which I, I don't do, but you could. Um, and then you would attach those to the board with PVA. So fabric, so I would use for book cloth and for paper, I would use a PVA glue or you could use paste, or you could use a mixture of the two. Um, but for leather, for paired leather, you would use paste. Um, and if you don't wanna make up your own wheat paste, you could always use this nori paste, which is great. You could mix half and half with PVA glue with the nori paste. Um, and if you don't have PVA glue, you can use another white glue. I wouldn't use Mod Podge, but you can use like, I think it's perfect paper or Aileen's tacky glue. You can use that as well for attaching to boards. And then other covers, um, you know, for soft cover books, there's paper, there's leather, there's craft text, there's cork fabric, there's um, you know, painted canvas, there's craft text. Frankly, if you can make it into a book cover, there's wood, you can, acrylic, you can use sheets of acrylic. Um, if you can drill holes in it, um, it can be a book cover or add glue to it. It can be a book cover. So um, don't be limited by your imagination. Well, are you limited by imagination? Hopefully not. So um, there's many, many different options. But if you're just referring to the book board, I would just say the three main ones are cloth, paper and leather. All right. Um, this is a question from Sandy that um, was relevant during the challenge. Um, so during the five day challenge that we had recently, we took a piece of copier paper and covered it with um, a napkin. And we did that on thin copier paper. So Sandy's question is, um, should all cover papers be glued to a sheet of copier paper or would you only do that with lightweight ones? Um, Yes, Sandy, you had that correct. You would only, if you were covering a book board with just regular paper, you don't need to layer it up in any way with copier paper. So if it was a handmade paper or um, a scrapbook paper um, or some of you jelly printed, you could just wrap the board as it is. The only reason we put it on the thin copier paper was that the, um, the napkin was so thin that the gray book board would show through. So, um, I think you kind of, I think you already knew that, but um, good question. Um, a quick question from Tammy. She's got some Amati paper. Do I use it in bookmaking and if so, how? Great question. Tammy, if you want to know what Amati paper is, it's from Mexico and it's made from the bark of a tree. Um, it's either a wild fig, the nettle or the mulberry. Um, and I don't have any because I don't, use it that much. Um, it's often, you'll see, it's often got quite a lot of holes in it um, and it's pricey. It's really expensive. I have used it in the past for soft cover books and when it has the holes in it, Tammy, I will, um, uh, hold on, let me just go back to uh, the other screen. Let me see, hold on. There we go. <laughs> it's one of those um, sort of very um, earthy organic papers that often has big holes in. So when I make a soft cover book, I'll often layer it up with another piece underneath. Um, I have I have wrapped book board with it, but I do find it quite brittle. So you'll need to um, see, you know, whether it really could be. You just need to keep that in mind if you want to wrap book board with it. Um, I've used it to line the inside of leather. So do you see how um, I just don't have any examples because I've given them all away. But this leather here, I've I lined with paper, but you so you could line that. So especially it's got like holes in. That might be kind of fun. Um, I have when I have used it the regular kind without the holes in, um, I will put a layer of matte medium over the top. Uh, or in fact, several layers of matte medium just to protect it because um, it is quite a delicate paper. And like I said, it's really pricey. So I tend to um, put a couple layers of matte medium on it. Um, I haven't used it in the last few years, I have to say. I like a, 
well, firstly, because I have a lot of my own handmade paper in my own stash. I didn't make it, but I have a lot of handmade paper already. So Andy would like kill me if I bought more. Um, also, it's, it's the kind of thing that you would buy and then it would sit in the drawer because it was too expensive to use and too precious. But um, those would be my tips for using that kind of Mexican paper. Huh. I'm through all the questions that came in via email, the ones that I didn't answer with another email. So I am open to answering whatever else you have for the next few minutes. Um, can I show that Cardi paper block, says Joanna. Yes, I can. Absolutely. Where did I buy it from? So this is a big one. This measures... Mm. I want to say eight, hold on. Yeah, eight and a, eight and a half by probably 11. Um, it's already bound. It's really nice. It came from Hiromi Paper Arts in California. They've got an online store and there are other sizes which are smaller. Um, and um, it's, it's nice. It's really nice. It's not, not cheap, really not cheap, but um, it's a nice book and it's... Uh, it's just got like a little link stitch, um, very nicely done. Um, good advice it is yum. Well, let me see if there's any other questions. Sure about needles, the mini matchbooks. I did too. Um, let me see any other questions. Feel free to pop them. Um, and Ingrid asks, you know, I often wonder about this question too, and Ingrid, when you glue two balls together, is the grain the same or opposite? I've heard both. Personally, I put the grains both going in the same direction, but I have heard of people who do them in the opposite and that that creates less warping. So um, you could try both. Like I say, normally I just do both going the same way because I'm a scaredy cat to try the other way. Um, but if you do try it, let me know. Um, and then when you are gluing them together, folks, you don't need to use a ton of glue. You just stipple a little bit of glue on, sandwich them together, and then, you know, wrap them however you're going to do them. Um, what other questions are there? Any? There we go. Um, what book would you recommend for different Coptic bindings? What book would I recommend for different Coptic bindings? Not quite. Are there different, I, I'm not quite sure what you're asking, Marlene, are there different Coptic bindings? I mean, that yes, there are different Coptic bindings. There are, um, so, you, the one that we did for the challenge was the most straightforward and the one you'll see most often, where you used a single needle and then you go in through a hole in the spine like that. The other main way that I teach a Coptic binding is with two needles, um, called a two needle Coptic binding. Um, and it's you, um, and you can do that, that method, you can attach the covers in exactly the same way with the two needle method. Um, so you have two needles for these sewing, you have, well, this has got five sewing stations, but you'd have four sewing stations or six or eight. You'd have two pairs of needles coming out of each sewing station. Another form of Coptic is what's called an Ethiopian um, board attachment, where you put the needle through the, like the edge of the cover board. And we have done that in the book club as well. Um, so that's called an Ethiopian board attachment. That's really fun and I really like that. You can do um, that method with a soft cover. Um, that was a previous challenge we did. You can obviously do it with a hard cover as well. Um, you can do a Coptic binder with single sheets, which we'll be doing later in the year in the book club. Um, there are different variations of a Coptic binding. Um, mostly, whether it's one or two needle though, and also how you attach the the board. There are different methods for attaching the front and back cover. Good question. Um, Cheryl says, any tips to use your Japanese screw punch so it doesn't get clogged up easily? Oh, yeah. Oh. Shaking it. <laughs> yeah, I must admit, when you're um, doing work with the screw punch, often the table is like covered. It should have a, um, well, it must have like a hole there, and that's where the um, excess paper and leather and whatever falls out of that little 
shaft here. They, it comes through here and out here onto the table. Um, but yeah, I wonder if it was too thick. That's weird. I just, I tend to just bang it on the side of my hand um, after I've done a couple and that tends to um, dislodge them either from the top or from the um, middle. Uh, let's see. Oh, Marlene says, so the Coptic was for artistic designs. The world's your oyster, honey. So um, back to Marlene's question for artistic designs, think about maybe putting your holes in different spots. So you just see here, we've just got these little quarter inch stitches. Well, think about maybe doing holes in a different pattern so that, you know, you could have some long, some short. Think about using different color threads. So if you did the two needle, you could do different color threads. Um, there's so much that you could do artistically with the Coptic binding. Once you've got the basic method down, it never ends. Um, let's see what else. Colleen, um, that's actually, um, I don't know how long you've been a book club member, Colleen. That was a challenge. It's actually um, on the website now for sale, the two needle Coptic binding. That was with a soft cover book. Um, so if you go to handmadebookclub.com um, and then it says at the top challenges, past challenges are now for sale. Um, the two needle Coptic is on there. It's with a soft cover, which I think is really nice. Um, but if you're in the book club, it's in the book club archives with a hard cover. Um, oh, the Greek. Yes, that's true. I think we might do the Greek Coptic in the, um, in the new year as well. We're definitely we're going to be doing the Celtic weave in the book club next year, which is, is, well, it's similar to Coptic, I guess. Um, Joanne, we, it's hard to explain now what the uh, Greek is. We will, I promise we'll get to that. Um, question from Barbara, how do you sharpen a screw punch? Great question. So you could, um, so you put your drill bit inside, whichever drill bit it is, you could um, run it along some sandpaper. I really like to use, um, I use a piece of leather and then, oh, I can't remember the name of it. It's um, Jewelers Rouge. It's, I don't have it here. So it's like a white stick. You get it in leather stores. And then you get a piece of leather and on the back of the leather, you so on, so a scrap of leather on this inside, you rub this white jeweler's rouge. It's almost like, um, almost like blusher. Do you remember years ago when you were little and you'd use one of those cream blushers on your cheeks and you thought you looked very sophisticated? It's a bit like that. And then you rub the, um, you roll the tip of the um, drill bit back and forth, like kind of twisting and rolling to sharpen it on the jeweler's rouge. Um, and the Jules Rouge is like $5 and it'll last you a lifetime. You'll never buy another one ever again. So if you go to somewhere like Tandy Leather or um, any other leather supplier, I don't think Michael's has it, um, but anywhere that sells leather will have them. Uh, uh, Colin was looking for one with a hard cover. No. Oh, yeah, we do have one in the book club. We'll do the hard cover one maybe for another challenge. Uh, do, do, do. Any tips? Screw punch. Um, what else? I'm just sorry, I'm just seeing. Uh, new friend here, saw you live. I came on board, you take Venmo when you sell. Uh, no, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, question from Melissa. Will Workout be selling pre-cut book board for project? No, but we will be. So I just got a delivery of some pre-cut book board today. So I will get that on the website as soon as I can, my friends. You won't have it in time for Christmas, but um, we will have that up um, later today. So I just took delivery. There's not many. I think there's 12 packs, right, Dale? 12. Dale's right here. There's 12 packs. So um, get it while you can. Do you know what we do have quite a lot of is the pre-cut board for um, uh, Secret Belgian Binding. Um, let's see, I think, let's see, uh, question from Marsha. I'd like to make some books with the friends, six and eight year old granddaughters. Nice suggestions, please, for book ideas. Simple, simple. Um, you could, so I'd love to know what everyone watching thinks. What would, what 
would you suggest? Because I know many of you do do um, projects with your grandchildren and children and nieces and nephews. I'd stay very simple. I do a pamphlet stitch. So three, you know, make a signature, three holes, do a pamphlet stitch, maybe an accordion book. Um, I will drop in a link for you into the chat. Oof, I'm not sure I'll be able to find it off the top of my head. Mm. Um, if you go to the, actually go to my YouTube channel and on my YouTube channel, there's a couple really simple books. There's one called an envelope book, which is really nice. So it's just one sheet of eight and a half by 11 paper, a few folds, and you can make a really cute envelope book. That's a really nice one. So look on the YouTube channel for some simple, um, simple books. There's also um, on my blog, a squash book as well. Um, or sometimes called a dragon book. I believe that um, is on the blog. I can put the uh, link for that up actually. Um, that would be a good option. Where are we? Yes, if you go to vintagepagedesigns.com and then click blog at the top or in the sidebar, click blog and then in the sidebar, there should be a list of some tutorials there. But the squash or the dragon book is really fun with kids. Um, but yeah, keep it simple, simple accordions, simple um, pamphlet stitch, maybe some folds. Um, but yeah, have fun with that. I love, love, love making books with kids. Um, Suzanne makes um, covers with duct tape. I love it. Dragon book is fun. Yep. Three hole pamphlet. Yeah. One sheet wonders. Yeah. One sheet wonders are great with kids. Um, just do a Google search, um, a search on YouTube for one sheet books. And, you know, they take an eight and a half by 11 book and then, you know, cut it in certain ways and it creates a full book or even an origami book. Be really fun. Thank you for all the suggestions. I like it. All right. Last question, my friends. I don't want to keep you here all day. I'm sure you've got holiday, um, holiday shopping to do or cleaning. I have. Well, what do I have? Actually, wrapping is what I have left. One more question. What is the best book for a sketchbook that will lie flat? Probably the Coptic Stitch. Um, I mean, the, not the Coptic Stitch, the Coptic Binding, I would say is probably the best for laying flat. Um, a Secret Belgian Binding does lie flat as well, fairly flat. Um, a French Link Stitch book lies flat, but I would go with a good old fashioned Coptic Binding for a nice um, sketchbook. Can't go wrong with that. Um, oh, great. Thank you, Joanne. Diana Trout has a book using one large sheet of paper. Nice. Yeah, the match book as well would be really fun with kids. Um, you're welcome. Dragon books. I love seeing all your suggestions. Thank you. It's like I say, it's a hive mind here. We all sort of throw in suggestions and things. So, um, excellent. All right, my friends. Well, I think I'm going to sign off for the year. I, well, I won't be here next um, week because it is Christmas week and I'll be spending time with my family. And then um, the first two weeks of next year, there will be videos on Thursday, but they will be pre-recorded. So um, in January, I'm going to be focusing on paste papers. So look out for a new video the first week of January um, that involves paste paper of some kind, some new patterns. I've got a book to recommend. I've got a new way of making paste that I'm going to be experimenting with. So I'm going to share that all with you in some pre-recorded videos because I'll be going to see my folks in the UK for the first two weeks of January. So, all right. Have a wonderful holiday, everyone. Thank you for joining me here live. Or if you're watching the replay, I appreciate you. Um, I have loved answering your questions. And if you didn't get your question answered this time, we will look, I will look through the submitted questions and try and get back to you with some answers. So, um, and thank you, Lisa. Merry Christmas, everyone. And um, have a fun and festive Christmas and New Year. Take care, everyone.